Okay, let's do this. Okay. What is one thing that was shown this season that is just like silly when you think about it for more than three seconds? I think uh, my silly thing would be everything. That's a fair point. Yeah. Come on, Carrie. Not everything reveals its silliness under three seconds of scrutiny. I mean, Weiss got to demonstrate some meaningful character growth after volume four, where she learned being a disrespectful twit doesn't exactly make people with power over you think you deserve any more special treatment. <laughs> Since Volume 3, she's gone from a girl too oblivious to understand the correlation between blowing someone off and falling out of favor with that person, to someone who's seriously considering thanking the bus driver. I just hope I haven't been a burden. All thanks to facing the consequences for her immature actions. You are no longer the heiress to the Schnee Dust Company. This line... Sorry, kid. My ship... My rules. Is the moment she realized that hating spoiled clueless bitches doesn't mean that she isn't still one of them. You go back and you look at Weiss in the second episode and then the Weiss you see now and it's like those Weisses would probably not be friends. A few episodes later she uses her newfound power of, of um, a ha having a functional character arc to help Yang through hers. A bit too well if you ask me, but this does play off a point I made in my volume 4 review. Depression isn't something you can just get over. You have to process your emotions and section them off into more manageable pieces so you can work through those. In Volume 4, Port helped her work through her fears, and she worked through some of the contempt she has for her father. In Volume 5, we see that she still has PTSD from fighting, and that she's holding on to a lot of anger from Blake to the point where mentioning her absence totally ruins the nicest moment she's had in probably six to eight months. Don't tell me to calm down! He's got a lot to deal with and not everybody realizes. Whoa! Maybe. Weiss tries to help Yang contextualize her sadness by telling her the exact same story we already gathered through context clues back in Volume 4. I was really happy with how this scene turned you out. You did a really good job with it, dude. Thanks, man. I, uh, I think this is one of the first scenes where I wrote, I was like, hey, I think I can write sometimes. It would seem so. Sometimes. Repetition aside, this scene works, because letting Yang know she's not alone on the issue of troubled childhoods, even though Yang has a sister whose experience is a little bit more than tangentially similar, allows her to realize that selfishly hogging all the trauma isn't exactly making life easier on anyone, sort of takes the righteous indignation out of being sad. Is, uh, everything okay? Yeah. It is. All refusing to move on does is cause everyone to walk on eggshells around you, lest you allow them to make you ruin otherwise pleasant situations. Whatever. Not that Weiss didn't do... Exactly that in volume one. I'm a victim! But let's just say she's had a lot of time to reflect on what a cunt she used to be. In fact, I think she's reflecting on that very scene as she continues talking to Yang. She was afraid to open up to people. She tried to keep her past separated from us. Sort of because the rest of the scene doesn't make sense otherwise. Eventually, those walls she put up came down. And it doesn't make sense, period, because why is she bringing up volume one? And if not, what is she talking about? Like, where did Weiss learn the epic therapy pro strat of saying relatable nonsense to get whoever you're helping to open up about their own insecurities? This is the only scene Weiss could have possibly been talking about. The one thing she was afraid of actually happened. This is where her walls come down. Well, maybe we were just tired of being pushed around. And the thing that she feared happening was exactly what happened. No one blamed her for anything. Yang's response doesn't gel with that context because Weiss blamed her. The innocent never run, Yang. That was the whole problem. From context, maybe you should assume that Weiss is talking about volume three. She chose to leave us. But there was no moment that could have been described as her walls coming down. What if I needed her here for me? So as far as we can tell, Yang is taking it upon herself to work through unresolved feelings, regardless of whether anyone around is able to guide her. Because throughout the whole of Volume 5, Yang is on a path back to her old self. Take this scene from Episode 1, where she decks this guy in the face for trying to touch her hair. That's a return to form if I've ever seen one. Well, I remember your first haircut. Ugh. Along with toying with these goons and throwing temper tantrums and not being the brightest tool in the shed. Yang's path to recovery is well, honestly pretty- A little bit more grounded approach with her. This is very important for us, this whole fight, is she was a little bit more on the defensive, a little more reactionary. Just this this idea of, you know, she's not showboating. No, oh, I forgot, I'm watching Ruby. They, they don't even realize this scene stopped making sense halfway through. They just needed to give the bumblebee shippers an excuse to keep watching. If she comes back, she will. What the fuck you just say to me, bitch? Uh, no, ho hold on, hold on, there's gotta be- uh, there's gotta be more positives. Um, uh, the- the Blake and Ilya fight is actually really well considered, for the most part. I love how the characters use their weapons with a deep understanding of the full range of their effectiveness. Like when they end up in this block clash, 
Ilya shocks Blake instead of waiting for her stamina to run out because Blake has so much upper body strength that you'd be forgiven for thinking that every shot with her is horizontally compressed so she can be cosplayed by someone other than two Adam Drivers standing next to each other. And the smart moves don't stop there. Blake significantly handicaps Ilya by remembering her strategy of blocking bullets with her whip and using that against her by firing ice rounds that render it useless long enough to disarm her. And the displays of reasonable intelligence aren't the only thing that make this action scene an obvious highlight of the volume. It features the return of the gunchucks in hands down the best animated segment of this volume period. And I remember when they first gave me this scene, the storyboards, there were none. It just was a single drawing that says, insert gunchuck fight here. <laughs> Wait, when, when Ilya got disarmed, her whip flew all the way over there. So like, why'd she run over and get it and then run all the way back? When did she run over to get it? She's just standing there spacing out. What are you doing? Fight! Like, she never crosses into frame during any of these cutaways. So, like, when... <sighs> That's my review, guys. Remember to smash that like button and get subscribed and check out my Patreon. And don't mind that extra hour and 54 minutes. I'm sure it's, uh, it'll be fine. In all seriousness, the reason I love Ruby is that they can give a character an actual arc for 13 and 9 tenths episodes, only to ruin it in the last two minutes, but then turn around six months later and tell the people who paid money for it that, whoops, we never meant to do any of that shit. This was an interesting scene for Yang. We tried very hard in moments leading up to this, Yang is trying to keep her emotions in check. I said, send me to crow, damn it! She's trying not to let herself fly off the handle. And and especially in this scenario, showing less emotion is a bit of a power play. Except without the whoops, because, um, they lack self-awareness. Judging what was presented in Ruby is almost tangential to the story they're trying to tell. Like Carrie saying that Yang knocking Shady Man's teeth out is somehow an attempt to brush him off. She tries to just brush him off. They could have shown her actually brush him off by pushing his hand away. Not grabbing it so he couldn't be brushed off even if he wanted to. I'm not trying to say he didn't deserve what he got, but this wasn't a threat of violence or intimidation that had to be responded to in kind, like in the Book of Eli. I don't want any trouble. Well, that's too bad. Because you a movie that was cited as an inspiration for the next Yang scene. The big inspiration for this one was Book of Eli. The first yeah. fight in Book of Eli. But it's still a good point of comparison here. To say she had to resort to this, or worse, that an emotionally healthier Yang would have gone to violence sooner is a disturbing proposition. He's drunk and he catcalls her. You look like a regular huntress. And a beauty at that. She picks a fight. The instant he tries to touch her hair. That's the opposite of avoiding picking a fight. You know, the fact that she's not trying to pick a fight immediately. Showing Yang getting angry, acting rash, blowing her top, and basically existing in a perpetual state of jump cut. Uh, look, okay, it's not the fact that there's a jump cut in a fight scene. There's a jump cut. Those happen too much, but according to the tech crew. <laughs> but what's funny is when you're working on these shots, you know, they come through one at a time in random order. Yeah, mm -hmm. we don't get an entire scene all at once going like, yeah, here it all is. No, it's just pieces. You would be surprised at how late those continuity mm -hmm. problems so I actually you, this shot right here. Head. Not that that's an acceptable excuse. My issue is that there is so much emphasis put on this exact combat maneuver in the previous scene. I mean, fuck. It's the entire thrust of the main character's arc this volume. I love Remember it. that headbutt later. Yeah. If you can call it that, which you can't. You're still lacking in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, Ruby has to learn how to headbutt chumps. It was a small moment, but we definitely wanted to make sure that we show that Ruby's learning a little bit of this hand-to-hand -hand stuff. But why can't she just crib a note from her big sis? You know, put your face right on a collision course with your opponent's knee, but then magically make him disappear in the next cut before punching him so hard he flies off in the wrong direction. The actual scene that managed to grace us with their presence showed Yang going through something that could charitably be described as trying to recover from trauma by falling back into her old comfort zone of beating up guys and basically being a bombastic little shit. She's more world-weary, for sure, but she did lose an arm and some neko eye, so it seems on point. But finding out that none of that was intentional is a bit mind-blowing. Yang didn't follow this guy into an obvious trap because she has itchy fists. I can't believe you were dumb enough to let me lead you here. She followed him into this obvious trap because... She lost too many brain cells along with that arm? And now she legitimately thinks this is how you avoid confrontation? You wait here. I'll go up ahead and make sure the coast is clear. 
Shady Man wasn't even invented to lead her into this ambush. Honestly, his inception was just a character in episode one that Yank could beat up. In a fight that they insist didn't happen. It was our first premiere episode. Without fights. No fights. To demonstrate just how much Yang doesn't beat people up anymore. A character that Yang could beat up. And like, where's her bike? I mean, by the time she gets to the whole rest of the camp back that way. That way. Huh? It's sundown. And I know we can never trust the shadows in this goddamn show, but this doesn't look like sundown to me. Yang is being escorted into the camp by the guys she beat up. How ruffled would your feathers be if you had to escort the girl that just bruised your face horrendously? Yeah. <laughs> so did she drive her bike to the camp and wait for them before walking in? Or did she leave her bike there and then go back into the woods before she takes the portal out? Oh, oh let, let's stay on the portal for a second. Something that we really wanted to do with Volume 5 was bring back some more smiles. They had the perfect setup for a visual gag and they let it slip by. They're in Mistral, right? A city carved into a mountain? Look at these elevations. That is way too steep for there not to be any stairs. And trying to push a motorcycle upstairs is comedy gold. I mean, comedy is tragedy plus time, right? So by that logic, what could be funnier than Yang traveling this perilous journey to see her sister, only to be held up by the same machine that allowed her to get this close in the first place? It's not perfect, but it's a damn sight better than throwing cringe humor and slapstick in wherever you can. Great. Thursday. Oh, what? Uh, so now Thor's canon. Does Nora know she's cosplaying a god? Thor's Day joke. <laughs> what? Or do the people of Remnant call it Thor's Day for a completely different reason? That's wrong on so many levels, it's no wonder Carrie tries his damnedest to keep the commentary off topic. My new goal on this commentary is to not help. <laughs> The more they talk, the more they slip up and ruin the parts of the show that accidentally worked. There's a little bit of a misdirect setup. Oh, that yeah. Kind of starts in here. Oh, that, yeah. That, that you guys are kind of wondering how this is going to play with the audience. The end of volume four, there's clearly, hey, this way's Ruby. This way's comically bandits. And people swear up and down that it's obvious that she goes one way or the other. And I even addressed how it's blatantly obvious that she drives off to the right. We were trying to not do that. So if you heard the motorcycle go slightly one way in the surround sound, that wasn't intentional. What else did I say at the end of that review? And I can't wait for every positive thing that I said to be completely invalidated within the first episode of Volume 5. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, quite a lot of it actually Perhaps did, and I'm sure I'll get to every last bit of it. Yeah, we wanted to have this kind of misdirect or question going into it. So when we got to present that moment, we said, okay, well, let's make it look like she's going to Raven. And, you know, she is, but let's mess with the expectation of yeah. that and what exactly she is <laughs> going there for. Looking for Ruby makes sense because she knows where she's going and the route she's taking. Ruby was heading to Mistral. And looking for a tribe of bandits who are, um, what's the word? Never settling in one place. Isn't the most productive use of your time when all you have to go on is a secondhand account of their whereabouts last fucking year. I know that Crow told you where your mother's been at these days. If she was looking for Ruby, but ran into the bandits by coincidence, and then, oh... You're going to save me time. Would have actually made sense. But normal people don't wander around a whole continent following a trail of freshly raped and pillaged towns in hopes of saving time. Especially not when their headspace is supposedly to avoid picking fights. I didn't want a fight. They started it. I'm gonna be doing this. If you get hit, it's your own fault. I would just like to call out the attention to detail. Seriously, guys, your propensity for doing stupid shit for the sake of fucking with the audience is going to be your downfall. And I'm not speaking hypothetically, that is what you chose to call it. And you think killing me is really for the greater good? No, but getting rid of your family is. They didn't think this line was raising death flags for Blake's parents. I, mean, I don't know if you were. I was not intentionally trying to raise a, nah. a death flag for nope. any of them. Like, nope. Or maybe they did. We wanted to clearly be like, hey, things are not going to go well during this fight and someone is probably not going to make it. I honestly can't tell. Carrie's entire thought process fell apart in less than 10 seconds. It's worth noting that they've been setting up the death of the Belladonna since episode one. Just leave Menagerie before it's too late. And then in unambiguous terms in episodes five and eight. But not before you've slaughtered her family. Now, Miles wrote this scene. Um, I thought you did a great job with this scene. Thanks, man. And most, if not all, of the other Blake scenes since Volume 4. 
So maybe what Carrie thinks about this scene doesn't matter, but Miles is quick to agree with him that I, I wonder if they have trouble identifying simple concepts in their own writing, like what a scene is communicating to their audience. Pro tip, when a character says that someone's gonna die, and everyone else in that scene believes them. You heard Ilya, my family's in danger. And then we cut to them, and all their bodyguards are dead. That's what raising a death flag is. They somehow managed to accidentally instill some tension into this arc without it seeming rushed or forced by actively trying to do the opposite of that. Now, when I watched volume five week to week, I was convinced that no one was gonna die in this fight. Not because I believed their survival was foreshadowed in any way, or because I thought any of the threats made against them were meant as red herrings. They must be silenced. No, I was confident because I've studied the past writings of Mrs. Luna and Shakras, when and know that murder is an action that requires agency to commit. Writing the chorus trilogy for Red vs. Blue, after writing the scene where General Donald Doyle, spoiler alerts, dies. I had to, like, I closed my laptop and went for a walk because I was just like, that dude deserves so much better and I was really sad for him. And characters written by them do not have such faculties. Fennec's death, tragic as it was, happened in a way that was no one's fault. Fennec maybe shouldn't have been charging up that blast, bud. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Sun broke the pillar by accident, and all Blake was trying to do was save her dad. No one's responsible for a death here. No one has any choices that require reflection or introspection. Go help Blake! No one needs to develop from this incident. No one could. The cherry on top is that Fennec is a redundant character. So the story doesn't have to correct course in any way as a result of his abrupt removal from it. He's so redundant, in fact, they actually mix them up. They make Fennec weary of Adam's plans in an earlier episode. He seems unwell. It's really around this point where they're starting to see some of the cracks forming in Adam. I would say especially um, Fennec. Especially Fennec, yeah. yeah. But he's the one who dives in to die for the cause. It reminds me of when Obi-Wan jumps out this window in Attack of the Clones. We are here to protect you, Senator. Not to start an investigation. We will find out who's trying to kill you, Padme. We will not exceed our mandate, my young Padawan learner. Except without any of the good writing leading up to it. So all for the sake of manipulating the audience, without allowing their characters to suffer any consequences that would change their outlooks, Miles and Carrie wasted an entire continent. Not that they were going to do much with it anyway. The question, what's going on, is the albatross around this whole series, because show, tell, but husband and huntresses are just so much more romantic and exciting, cool, just yeah, uh, yeah. tell in a commentary track, and he was worried and he's going to go talk to the mayor about seeing if they can get a huntsman to come in because he thinks something bad's about to happen, tell in a Q&A, and we're like, oh, well, we can say it at a convention. It's like, well, that's not great storytelling past us. Tell in a world of remnant, communication, empathy, and teamwork. And the thing that would make the most sense to any rational human being are all extremely different. The very first Blake scene in this volume has a massive problem in it. And no, I'm not talking about how they implied something happened off screen instead of just, you know, showing us the thing that was supposed to have happened. Unbelievable! Total garbage! Look how angry they are. If only we knew what affected them so deeply. If that phone didn't have any proof that Corsic and Fennec did anything wrong, why did they suspect them in the first place? Like, I know I've worked with them for many years, but I never noticed they were kind of creepy until some guy I've openly expressed contempt for pointed it out. Why did they confront them in private if they suspected them with so little proof? You're telling me the chieftain doesn't have enough sway with the police to get a search warrant? Why was Blake pleased with that turn of events? Everything's gonna be okay. And we also wanted to show that we have a slightly more optimistic Blake. At least outwardly. At least outwardly pleased? For the benefit of whom? She's with Sun and the only two people who know the situation better than her. Gira and Callie know exactly how much power they should have on this continent, and since they failed to get any results, how much power they actually don't have anymore. Now, the first two volumes did a great job of showing us and telling us that racism is totes coolio, bro. Whether it be controversial labor forces or that no aspiring guardians of peace see a problem with this behavior from another aspiring guardian of peace. <laughs> Please stop. Or a cop throwing a rock at a stowaway's face. Or our main character, our motherfucking simple soul, the motherfucking embodiment of purity as according to Blake. I remember getting to know Ruby and thinking, this girl is the embodiment of purity. Goes, oh Weiss, you're so justified in your blanket hatred of an entire race. Or the formation of the White Fang itself being a peaceful response to an act of war. Or that an entire warehouse full of faunists sign up for a suicide mission led by a human just because he promised to help them overthrow the government. You and I all have a common enemy. 
the ones in control. Or, most telling of all, when they tried to start backpedaling, their best effort was to turn the White Fang leader into a rapey, abusive creep. Hello, my darling. Almost like they realized a little bit too late that the White Fang were more sympathetic than our so-called heroes. So yeah, none of these people are interested in defending the humans, which made a lot of sense to me, much like Yang attempting to conquer her PTSD. I like how this crowd is just cheering. We must go to Haven and protect it at all costs! They're not listening to him until after he gets really explicit about what he means. He wants the Faunus to not only go back to being peaceful with the humans, but also start infighting with themselves? Ilya pops out to say what everyone is thinking until Blake points out that the White Fang are attacking Faunus as well. The people of Menagerie will come to understand what happens to those who speak out against the White Fang. But no, these people were just busy. It's hard to get a movement going because look, everybody has lives and their lives are important. It wasn't like the White Fang was offering them something better. The Faunus are the dominant species of this planet. They just had other shit to do. You know, if you have kids or someone depending on you, like, you have to think about them, too. It's not just your life. Isn't having kids, like, a reason to fight for a better future? Your brothers and sisters. M Mata? Please. Stop this. We didn't want to have just like one speech give you the movie moment the first time everybody hears about it. No, we didn't want it to be uh, easy. You didn't want the one speech movie moment. You wanted a two speech movie moment. The the White Fang arc could have been earlier if we just kind of said a couple lines and just had somebody change their mind quicker. What do you mean by that? Nothing changed between speech one and speech two that made any of these Faunus personal lives less important or busy. They just suddenly buy into Blake whataboutin' her own race's history? We are just as capable of hate and violence as the humans, but I don't think any of us would jump at the chance to point that out. If I didn't know any better, I would guess that somebody else wrote Ruby. And Miles and Carrie were just the poor saps who were forced to record the commentary blind. Beating the hell out of each other doesn't help. Are we listening to the people who supposedly wrote volume one? And the worst part was, it was working. Are we listening to the people who supposedly wrote episode motherfucking three of this volume? Volume? The people both in and out of the White Fang wanted faster results. Beating the hell out of themselves is supposed to help, though. The people of Menagerie are looking for simple answers to complicated problems. In what way is dismantling and replacing the entire government of the world a simple solution? The dirty, rotten humans that run our kingdoms. Government. Military. Even the schools. They're all to blame for your lot in life. Blake is advocating upholding the government that perpetuated this oppression. This kind of violence is not the solution. And the worst part was, it was working. We were being treated like equals. Back then, I think we were very optimistic, very ambitious, and also, if I'm being completely honest, like, a little naive. That's sure. a very difficult and incredibly complicated subject to tackle. They think they used to be naive. By what? Painting bigotry as a systemic problem so deeply rooted that it caused regular people to sign up for a suicide mission just to stop it? A problem so deeply rooted into the minds of these wannabe guardians of peace. Communication, empathy, and teamwork. Traits that are vital to any guardian of peace. Yeah, empathy. Fuck off. That they didn't see a problem with this. Ow, that hurt! You think that's naive? <laughs> and needs to be treated with a certain level of respect and seriousness. You think it's more respectful to the subject matter for Faunus to risk their own lives to uphold the system that allowed humanity to oppress them since before the Great War in the hopes that they'll, like, what? Stop? Now? For some reason? But, 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 but Adam is a rapey creep. The Belladonna name has brought me nothing but grief. You don't want to side with a guy like that, do you? He was spite. You can't admit who a guy who gets off on torturing his ex might not be wrong about every single thing he thinks. The Faunus and humans are, and should be, equal. The Faunus are the dominant species of this planet. I mean, they beat up the whole Vital Festival tournament roster. How exactly do you go up from there? Between Kira and Sienna, it's just more of a difference of opinion. Approach. But between, yeah, exactly, an approach, but between Kira and Adam, it's, uh, it's Adam more than that. Adam's not wrong. Faunus have night vision and claws and tails, double ears, camouflage, fucking wings. But no, it's much more mature to say that every single person can be defined by a single word. They are the personification of this word. You can't have a nuanced discussion about this stuff, right, Blake? It's a lot more complicated than that. Yeah. You're only talking about the future of your whole race, and there's no room in that future for people who can't be defined by one word. Ilya, please. 
You're gay! You know what, Carrie? You were right. I shouldn't have doubted you. I'm proud of you for admitting it. That's the first step to recovery. Cough syrup? Can I just blame everything on cough syrup? I think you can. I think legally you can. Now let me do my part and explain what you meant in what some might call an unnecessary amount of detail. Starting with our favorite game from last year, Time to Plot Hole. Now Volume 4 set an astonishing record of 11... The of Mistral. Oh, they haven't even animated anything uh, yet. It's about time! This isn't even a throwaway line from some piece of supplemental content that everyone clearly forgot existed. Hit them. This retcons a major source of tension from the last half of Volume 4. Was Vic Mignogna too exp- I mean, was Crow gonna survive Tyrion's poison? Now, it was damn near explicitly stated that he was getting help with his poke wound. Ruby. But to drop it without any acknowledgement? I'm amazed that the first three seconds of volume five fall apart under three seconds of scrutiny. We could have started right here, which I know is something I've said about every volume, except paradoxically volume one, because it started with a narrator telling us stuff we didn't need to know in a way that contradicts the purpose of a narrator existing. Did you kill Ospin? But this rings true with what I said at the end of my volume four review. Ugh, it's about time! It's about time? What about the whole time Ruby was writing that note? But I think you'd all be proud to know that I made it to Mistral. Crow's aware that they're in the city right now because he acknowledges that he's been saved. Aren't I normally the one saving you? Miles mentions that the note from the end of volume four exists. Yang just hands her the note from volume three. What does this say? Work on your handwriting. <laughs> Well, Yang never got the note. Oh, no, no, from volume three. Yeah, the runaway note. Yeah, you're right, yeah. you're right. At least in his own mind. And I don't want to hear any of this, oh, the end of volume four was in the kingdom. And volume five was when they got to the city crap. Do you really think a road sign between two cities inside of the kingdom would also point to the kingdom? That's almost as ridiculous as a couple of writers forgetting what the opening scene of their show was. Oh yeah, we started on black, I forgot. Which is exactly what happened, so I'm not saying you're wrong for believing that, I just don't want to hear it. Whose idea was it to walk again? Well, we did face many obstacles. Broken airships, destroyed settlements. How is that an answer to Nora's question? Why are they discussing these things at all? You know, all those people and monsters that tried to murder us. What people do you mean? The one person who introduced himself with all the melodramatic flair of an actor told he was going to be playing the crazy one. Yeah. Fuck. Whose name you didn't bother to remember? <laughs> Why, friend, my name is Terry. They did this exact same thing in Volume 3 when Pura makes the bold claim that she's ever fought with murderers. Well, murderers. You stolen valor lying bitch. You wouldn't be so cavalier about anybody saying that if you got murdered, now would you? Or are you trying to imply that more people tried to kill them along the way? So many, in fact, that they don't remember who almost gave Vic Mignogna an excuse to get out of the- I, I mean the guy who almost killed Crow? You shouldn't imply that the more interesting part of the story happened off screen. And you certainly shouldn't imply that that thing was so crazy, it caused Jean not to single out Tyrion as the weirdest thing that happened to him on the trip. He should have said, yeah, if we took the train, I wouldn't be having nightmares about Tyrion. When Tyrion's fingertips brushed his prostate. Why did he find me interesting? Uh, like I said, only one of us almost died. Hey. Hey. <laughs> I like how not even the characters in this scene buy that garbage, unless they're legitimately trying to dissolve the minuscule amount of tension derived from having a gigantic grim break two of the most likable characters' auras. So, we're not supposed to feel tense before their aura breaks, or after or when the entire story contorts itself into putting them in a life-threatening situation, or when a character loses their limb, or even when a bad guy does. Tyrion's in need of a new tale. So, let me get this straight. The only event in the story we're supposed to feel any sort of emotion over is when a robot gets cut in half. Because what, with the tower down, nobody can call tech support to be reminded to turn her on and off again? This is the first 30 seconds of the volume, and every line so far has either retconned something from volume four, or been expounding upon how pointless it all was. And it doesn't get better from here. We're about to get our first and last glimpses of Mistral. We got the tiniest little peak. 
And it's a matte painting. Because sets are expensive to build, we decided, hey, let's actually do some matte paintings that will kind of let us show more than we probably would have had the ability to actually build in 3D. Oh my gosh, look at all the weapons! Yeah. Uh, look at them. What, what, what do you mean? Look at them! Look at all those weapons! There was nothing besides minimum effort stopping them from putting one of those little binoculars on a stick here. Where you put a quarter in, then you, you you look at shit. Crow did call this the scenic route. I would have figured I'd take you kids on the scenic route. So it makes less sense for there not to be one. To be fair, this is the real frame they're showing when Ruby yells that, so... She spotted these three daggers at this kiosk that aren't even visible from this perspective. Best vision in Remnant goes to Ruby Rose! <laughs> yeah. There's no shopping bazaar. There aren't any people in this map painting. Main city's right under the council's eye, sure, but... Keep all these happy shopping fucks in your mind from when Lionheart says, Since that day, Mistral has been in chaos. Like seven minutes from now. As if we were all gonna forget by then. This is the only glimpse we get of Mistral, the city that we've been walking towards for an entire volume, and they expect us to forget all of it within seven minutes. Uh, okay. Like how Crow yells at Leo for not waiting for them at the entrance as if he had called ahead. Why weren't you waiting for us at the entrance? But at the end of the scene, he reminds him that the local comms are up at all. We'll stay in the city for the time being. Local comms are still up. After the rest of the scene plays out exactly how everyone expected it to, Nora says this. So, is this not going at all like anyone thought it would? Nora is the one who suspected Lionheart would need their help at all. Why aren't we in more of a hurry to get to Haven? Was that sarcasm? Was that poorly delivered sarcasm? How do you poorly deliver sarcasm? Now, the scene that follows isn't bad at all. Leo is a dirty backstabber, and he does a good job of not giving that away. Every lie he tells is... Believable, except for the, you know, since that day line implies that the chaos would still be going on, which is, you know. And, of course, trying to convince us that anyone who believed Penny is a real girl after seeing her green sparky insides is someone worth protecting. Every house in every kingdom saw that poor girl ripped to pieces. Besides those two obvious falsehoods, it all feels based on a kernel of truth because of his performance. I'm sorry. I know you've all traveled a long way, but I will do everything I can to help. And yet he's still working with Salem, which in a vacuum would communicate that she probably has some reasonable sounding end goal, which is achievable. At least until Miles has to go and ruin it. I would just like to call out the attention to detail to all the extra crap he's yeah. got stored in the crawl space. Lionheart, his mind is very busy yeah. and messy and all that stuff and kind of reflecting yeah. that and how he keeps his things. In what way does that mesh with what we're seeing? This is not attention to detail. Yeah, sure, his mind is messy. That's why he was able to keep up this seamless bluff against Crow, who is, well, I mean, prob probably drunk, but maybe, yeah. Whenever they execute something well, it's almost like they were trying not to on purpose and failing. We have got to work on your improvisational skills. They took a lot and just shoved it off to the side, like the whole concept of Haven. You know, we made the conscious choice of the school was a little bit on the emptier side, so we didn't get to unfortunately see a lot of students. We tried kind of over the course of this volume, but especially in this first episode, to show off Mistral and Haven. Yeah, you don't though. We see the inside of one house a lot. Look, I know that we spent like way too much time in this house this volume, but can I just say... What a baller house. I know. I, I would wish, love this house. I wish I could rent this house out. <laughs> Crow wanders around the slums a little. And we finally see that faunus oppression we were promised. Because Mistral is like way worse than Vale. Mistral is one of the uh, less faunus friendly kingdoms in the world. Definitely opposed to like Vacchio as well as uh, Vale. Which would explain why the faunus are getting supportive ass pats and running shops in the city center. And running your school. Oz purposefully appointed a faunus to his school as a way of trying to progressively move things forward with the kingdom. And you have the police escort an army of foreign faunus with tiki torches to the campus of said school. Way to go on that world building, guys. It's like you didn't even bother. It never came out in this volume. I wanted to know about the culture without spoilers. You know, is there anything you can tell us about that? Um, it's very varied. 
can say. Each of the main kingdoms that you'll learn about this season definitely do each have their own specific culture and practices and clothing styles and stuff. They even replayed the stinger from volume four. N not because they forgot they already did it, but because they can't trust people to watch to the end of their volume. We decided to put this clip in the actual volume because we never know for sure that people watch after the credits. I want to make sure people understand when this happened canonically. They don't even trust people to make it all the way to the credits because of how they treat the second reveal that Watts and Leo were working together. But I think it leads to in the next episode seeing why we don't like Leonardo Lionheart. Yeah, just in case people forgot to watch at the end of the volume last year. Which should maybe tip you off that you shouldn't dedicate most of your goddamn volume to characters sitting around hoping the plot will happen upon them like Publisher's fucking clearinghouse. This is a hard scene to balance out too because Ooh. I felt like the audience could really relate to the characters in this scene because it's like, cool, we made it here and the first thing we're told is, well, you're gonna have to wait a bit. As soon as possible does not mean tomorrow. It's like, oh man, it's a tough pill to swallow. And they have the gall to say this. But for volume five, we wanna let people know like, hey, stuff's happening, stuff's moving. Nothing's moving. Not even in the literal sense of physically moving around most of the time. Scene after scene, nothing happens. And I feel the need to address a common response to the nothing happens criticism. And that's that, oh well, there can't be action scenes in every episode. To which I would say there is a wide berth between nothing happening and a fight breaking out. Not a single punch was thrown in her and it would be absurd to suggest that nothing happened in it. No, no, to get to the bottom of volume five, we need to talk about the dreaded diner scene. Aptly named because it refers to a scene taking place inside a diner. Doing this is bad writing, automatically. And there are amazingly some writers who still make this mistake. Take for instance this hack fraud called Edgar Wright, who set multiple scenes from his breakout hit Driving Miss Baby in diners. Which obviously means they're bad. Let's use this scene to illustrate a larger point. Now why else, old man? You should be thinking all that. For me to walk in fucking death wish. One character is acting out in a way that is detrimental to this group as a whole. What you do within this group affects all of us. And the other members are angry with them. It's a shame context stops mattering the second you walk into a diner, because going out for some shitty burgers on your way back from a shootout is a pretty quirky way to start a session of psychoanalyzing the people that think you're a crazy bastard. Just an educated guess. As a side note, Bats uses way more than one word to sum up Buddy's personality. I'll sit this well. Then, while still in a diner, we see a character's relationship get tested. A relationship that we've seen built up over the course of numerous diner scenes, so it basically doesn't count even though it's never spelled out in explicit expositional dialogue. We witnessed the character development for ourselves, and we feel the tension in this scene. But it happened in a diner, so it's all for naught. But Volume 5 doesn't have any diners at all. So it can't have bad scenes, right? I mean, look at how expertly a typical diner setup is sidestepped by simply removing the walls. So it can't be a bad scene, even though the only reason this scene is happening at all is because Blake and Son spent the entire first part of the episode bothering people who we had known didn't want anything to do with them since episode three. <clears throat> it's not the fact that they repeat information because not everyone is like you and me for a third time When we go public tomorrow, they're not going to stand for any of it. Your plan isn't gonna work Blake in the scene itself The fawn is here in menagerie moved here because they were tired of fighting Menagerie is filled with people that just want to be left alone And it's not even a problem that they paint this repetition as necessary by having a character that's been present in scenes where this information was Demonstrated mention how helpful it was that it was told to him a third fucking time I Guess I never really thought about it like that or even that there's more than one instance of thrice repeated exposition in this scene alone She lost her family in a mining accident when she was young Where was my help when my parents were killed in a dust mine one day? There was a cave-in at the mines I was at school when the news broke. And it's also fine that this scene tells us how a conflict we never got to feel is going to have like a super bad consequence, man. Just take my word for it. The problem is whatever happens at Haven is going to affect them whether they like it or not. Leaving aside that it didn't make sense based on what we've already seen. If you truly, truly want to help your people, now is the time to support Adam. I mean, honestly, what? besides Blake returning, obviously, got worse for the Faunus after the fall of Beacon. The communication network is down. The loss of the CCT has brought global communication to a crawl. The network isn't going down -er if Haven falls too. I mean, a boat run by humans took multiple Faunus to Menagerie like right after the fall of Beacon. 
So there's really no reason to believe that the White Fang really have that much of an effect on how the normal person feels towards the normal Faunus. And the White Fang is more of a target now than ever before. So either the White Fang win, and things get better for the Faunus at the expense of the humans, or they're gonna lose. And Faunus treatment will go back to how it was five years ago, which was worse than now. And that's what Blake is suggesting. And it's obviously not that a character in the scene openly states the ways she has supposedly grown as a person. I'm going to try and help her the way you helped me. The reason for that growth... You showed me that sometimes you need to be there for a friend, even when they don't want you to be. And the effects that growth will have on her future relevance to her own storyline in literal terms a second grader could understand. It's about time I saved my friends for once. You know, instead of ever actually showing us that stuff. None of these things make the scene bad because it doesn't take place in a diner. It takes place in this little outdoor shopping bazaar with these submerged fender stands. What is one thing that was shown this season that is just like silly when you think about it for more than three seconds? And I could go first. Go ahead. I love seeing the little shops in the shallow sea. What are you... What, f fish have to shop. What are you... <laughs> Why is that the stupid thing you point out? See, it's not about the context. You get riled up about stopping at a dime. Or what it's demonstrating about the characters or anything that it could be foreshadowing or paying off. And that's super lucky for the writer's reputation because volume five is laden with scenes of characters talking about something that they could just be doing right now. If it isn't some repetitive nonsensical info dump. Like in the bandit camp, for instance. We see back in episode two, when Raven finds Weiss, she says, We just hit the jackpot. Which probably means they're going to ransom her back to her father to anyone whose IQ is a positive number. Or hell, you could probably figure it out if it's anywhere in the ballpark of Absolute Zero. Because we have an entire scene dedicated to telling us that. We don't normally deal in trafficking people. That changed. And of course... You're going to ransom me back to my father. So the bandits got character development from a trait that was never established about them to a trait that was set up the very first time they were introduced as a concept. Once we realized we had a schnee. Great! But we do get new information in this scene. Your sister isn't in Mistral anymore. That apparently Weiss was on this little cargo ship flying here for over a week. General Ironwood closed the borders and recalled all of his little troops and tin cans. By this time next week, the Kingdom of Atlas will be officially closing its borders. Eh, as long as it takes place somewhere that food isn't served, it's a good scene, right? Well, somewhere food isn't served for money anyways, you can still have all the food in the world. The lazy framing of characters sitting around the table, saying things that we should have just seen even at the dance when you spilled punch all over yourself or already fucking no please tell me you let that lady have it having all these characters share the crazy adventures that they've been through and just getting little snippets of each story you know weiss just talks about oh yeah i summoned a thing at a party and she was the worst it's like oh we remember that we remember that moment it's really really bad because every character needs to know about every moment of every other character's lives and one reason why we're super excited to have the gang all back together again is so we don't have to do catch-ups with everybody constantly yeah <laughs> and on screen is the perfect place for those incredibly necessary revelations to be had. I think we should do it like they do in Dragon Ball Fighters. How's that? Someone new is introduced into what's going on, mm -hmm. and they say, what's going on? And Bulma says, well, let me tell you what happened. And then it fades to black. Mm -hmm. And then it fades up from black and says, wasn't that crazy? Ah. Cool. We're not actually learning anything about these characters in these scenes, except that they do in fact talk to each other from time to time. And I mean, that's progress because that used to be a big mystery. In volume two, in a tongue-in-cheek way, Jean references that he and Ren have a deep personal connection despite the fact that they've never interacted before. To be perfectly honest, I don't know that much about you personally, but darn it, I consider you to be the brother I never had. And I you. Which I used to and continue to take as a self-aware jab, even though later in volume two, Blake talks to Velvet. I like that they have a relationship, even though like they have so little interaction. And Monty says that's supposed to imply a deeper relationship, even though Velvet isn't a real character. I just made that name up and you believed me. Which goes to show you a bigger problem with these characters. It's not believable that they have relationships outside a few groupings that are slathered into as many scenes as possible. Did you realize that before Weiss was oh so happy to see Yang at the bandit camp, they had like two and a half scenes together? Other than that, they only interacted through the other characters. Oh, not you again! And even their tournament fight was a 
an extremely anemic character scene. Wouldn't this be the perfect time to exemplify their relationship and exhibit some team woe? Okay, bye. But in volume five, it's all hugs and therapy. Great. So it's just they already blew it. The overcorrection just looks bad. I mean, in episode one, Jean says, Yang's mom? Which is a major shock to the system because we're forced to acknowledge that these characters had like the kind of normal human conversation that would let your friends know that your blonde sister with a different last name has a different mom. Don't you have like four sisters? Uh, seven. <laughs> You know, that actually explains a lot. And having them sit around and talk about nothing at this point just makes us wish they hadn't. No, no, and out of control isn't awesome. Oh. Like seriously, between these two scenes, who took the time to unset the table and move it into the corner? It wasn't where it was before. And this cut doesn't make any sense because it's contiguous time, right? <laughs> John sets down the pot and then takes his seat. So when they all start talking at the same time, it's supposedly actually happening? <laughs> Ruby is pleading for some duck sauce. <laughs> and then she says thank you, even though nobody handed it to her. <laughs> they have a full pot, even though they all start the meal with full bowls. <laughs> There's only one dirty pot at the end of dinner, so why do they all have full bowls before John brings the full pot to the table? No way. I don't believe it. What part of this story does Nora not believe? That Weiss restrained herself? Please tell me you let that lady have it. Of course not. That she wanted to enact violence on her? Even if I did really want to. Or that she managed to summon at all? Nora witnessed Weiss summoning. How about the clip where the writers demonstrate their own personal growth by moving on from not knowing how to count to four and instead not knowing what pushing is? Just to clarify too, it's not a rocket booster thing that she does. The idea was Nora was putting so much force into Yang's arm, all Yang had to do was simply detach it and Nora sent herself flying into the wall. No, 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 no. we're not a couple of prison colonists. We're gonna arm wrestle like gentlemen. You're not aware of British rules. Three, two, one. Just want to get that clarification out there. I can't make this up. They think exerting force to the left makes someone fly backwards. What is this, Fox News? Did people think it was a rocket punch? People thought it was a rocket punch. Uh, Why doesn't Yang have a rocket punch? Rocket punch! After years of passing off stupid bullshit as the rule of cool. That's, uh, uh, that's amazing. That is so cool! Why do they draw the line at rocket punches? Or how about when they conflate aging with character development in a desperate bid to pass the buck of writing compelling character arcs off to the never-ending march of time? It's been a long time. Now I'm coming back home. Wait! We've all grown in our own ways. Listen up, you little shits. If you think that temporal inevitability serves as a stand-in for writing character arcs, you are not allowed to pretend that not setting an official timeline is acceptable. Anytime you bring in, like, official dates and stuff, that's when plot holes can come up. Yeah, don't mention a date, but do base your entire philosophy of character development around the passage of time. When you think back to an embarrassing moment in your life and you're just like, ugh. It's those moments, it's like, mm -hmm. oh boy, it's, it's midnight, time to go to bed. And your brain's like, hey, remember that one time you asked that girl to dance and she rejected you in front of your friends? Let's really deep dive that for the next hour. You remember that one time that they like broke into your gym locker and they took your pants and they threw them around while you cried? Have you ever felt embarrassed? That embarrassment, that desire to go back and tell yourself not to be so stupid, that just proves you're not the same person you used to be. Congratulations, you've had a character arc. That'll be whatever the salary of a professional writer is. And maybe it was a little on the nose here. Were they implying that they didn't used to be embarrassed, but became embarrassed after growing as people? Dwelling on your past is about as far from character development as someone could possibly be. All that wishing you'd done something differently means is that you didn't get any value out of that experience that'll help you in the future. I tried to 1v1 a Nevermore on the second day of school. Unsurprisingly, there are more than a few things wrong with what Ruby just said. First of which being, what about the Deathstalker? Secondly, it was Yang who 1v1 the Nevermore. Third, Ruby very pointedly had everyone's help to attack the Nevermore. Fourth, Ruby's attack on the Nevermore was successful and probably the thing that landed her the leader position. And speaking of the leader position, the thing she had to overcome in volume one was the burden of responsibility, which she did. Nope. Nope. Ruby's reckless attack on the Nevermore 
or the Death Stalker, if that's what they meant to say, didn't inform her character growth at all. Because in Volume 2, she recklessly splits off from her group twice. It's actually three times, but Volume 2 isn't canon, so who cares? In Volume 3, she actually tried to 1v1 in Nevermore. She took on a full town under grim attack by herself, which included 1v1ing a Nevermore. In Volume 4, she recklessly disobeyed Crow's orders and attacked Tyrion, which almost got Crow killed, and almost getting Crow killed didn't even inform her character at all, because she demands to go to Kuro Yuri against Ren's protest. See, the mark of a professional is not a persistent effort to put forth the best possible feats of storytelling. That's... Annoying. I wanted to make sure it was still very much on brand. It's that the scenes aren't specifically set in a diner. Otherwise, they're bad on principle. You know, this next line could sum up everything wrong with the way Wiles and Carrie write dialogue. <laughs> How can six kids possibly make so much noise eating dinner? You know, if I didn't have so many other great examples to choose from. That's what you can't believe? Well, yeah! and all the other magic and stuff. Some of which cut straight to the chase in the repetitious nonsense by literally being tautologies. Salem only uses people until they are no longer useful. But what does this tell us about Crow? Uh, nothing. He was trying to get their attention, so I mean mission accomplished, I guess. Shouting a rhetorical question and then standing there with this glum look on your face while Jean leans against the wall nonchalantly looking like, did the guy who voices me really write that line? I mean, by referencing all six kids and specifically the eating dinner part as if we needed to be reminded that that's what was going on, Crow clearly decided that's what he was going to yell before Nora started playing the music on her phone speaker. And that line exists to transition into the next scene with a Death rattle of awkwardness. Off screen, two characters make the decision to tell Team Runger what's going on, and the part they deigned necessary to show us was the main characters not being able to understand something the audience already fucking knows. And to add insult to injury, this whole scene is canonically poorly timed. It's been far too long since you have all been together. Please, take tonight. Enjoy this moment. At the point where someone reasonably could have told them what was going on, they don't! We see Oscar smile and avert his eyes ashamedly. Which means he's grown as a person, obviously! Just don't make us do anything embarrassing. The choice of words doesn't serve any purpose. After a cut, we're just in another room, waiting for another character to say something out of the blue. So... The Maidens. The lead-in is almost a non-sequitur. Crow's annoyance at the volume and Oscar's nervous smile doesn't imply that we're about to be in for a history lesson. It's only through context clues that we learn that we skipped an entire exposition dump that we're about to get recapped on. <sighs> and obviously you never want to like retell the same exposition over and over and over and over again. Well, you sure go out of your way to do that in every single scene. We yeah, have to say it on screen. Yeah, exactly. And let these characters know. Yeah. The only things you ever do are repeat exposition and contradict it. They diner scened a diner scene. They dedicated the middle part of the movie to listening to characters sit around a table talking about things they just got done talking about while sitting around a table. What else is new? Delivering exposition should never be seen as something inherently boring or unnatural or something that has to break the flow of the narrative. Going over the Ozpin Oscar info and trying to make it as palatable and comedic as possible. The confrontation between Ozpin and Yang didn't have to emanate from the most boring scene in the world. We're getting into, hey Oz, why ain't you telling us all the things? Yeah. Yang is kind of the first person to do that. So, the maidens. Magic. Salem. It's all true? Yang isn't the first person to do shit. She got dragged into this conversation off screen and sat there silently until asked for her input. Miss Zhao Long, is this more or less what your mother told you? She has no agency over her own curiosity. If she did, she would have confronted somebody about what Raven told her. Or were they trying to imply that she just doesn't care and only brought it up because she had nothing better to do? I mean, what is wrong with you? Because that's what they ended up with. We didn't even see her reaction to finding out Ozpin reincarnates. They expect us to take so much for granted while insisting that Yang has had it up to here with going along with what she's told. Yang is growing up and not just gonna listen to what people tell her. And I think it's it's an important thing of like, don't just... It's good to ask questions. It's and, very good to ask questions. Okay, how about these ones? If the relics are dangerous, why isn't anyone using them against the Grimm? 
How will revealing the maidens exist cause a panic? Centuries ago, I sacrificed a great deal of magic to four young women. How did you hide them if they existed unmolested for centuries up to that point? No spoiler questions! <laughs> And I know this isn't a question, but the, uh... Would you believe me if I told you that one's been around since I was a boy? Yeah, you were a boy thousands of years before you made the maidens, you lying piece of shit. Thousands of years I have walked the surface of Remnant. There's this mound of nonsense on display here. Yang is asking questions because Raven told her to. You need to question everything. But she's hung up on, oh no, people can't be birds. Why would you do something like that? I mean, what is wrong with you? Yeah, only bats, and fish, and dogs and cats, and lizards, and ghosts, and literal gods, and genetically impossible, and bouncy, and keys, and robots, but certainly not birds. And everyone just goes along with it like that's the weirdest thing they've heard all day. Thousands of years ago, the gods, who were real by the way, gave me immortality and the ability to body snatch this kid who is going to be absorbed into my consciousness, leaving his body a soulless husk for me to pilot until someone renders it inoperable. This is perfect! Also, a drunk can fly. All right, now you're just messing with us. What else is new? When Jean is the most reasonable and likable character, you have a problem. And an author insert. And a dishonest writer. The one thing I can have, like, I think about with Jean is, um, he's like younger teenage me who didn't know what he was doing. I still don't know what I'm doing. So I just had to dig deep into my awful past. <laughs> Seriously. Don't listen to what anyone tells you. Just blindly follow them based on someone else's gut. If Ruby sticks around, then I will too. She somehow always knows the right thing to do. Super smart, Yang. She is listening to, to Raven. Super smart. So, what now? That is a difficult question. One that I believe is best answered tomorrow. And he only answers like two questions anyway. Well, I did have one more question. This scene isn't special. None of the dialogue has any purpose. They even discuss it in the commentary with all the self-awareness you'd expect from an emperor with a very brave tailor. You don't want to treat the audience like they're dumb, but at the same time you want to make sure that everyone's on the same page and yeah, it gets wild and we're start we're trying to get better about it. Pretty much everything the bad guys do is antithetical to characters driving the story. I, I stress pretty much because no amount of reasonable thought will stand in the way of the sheer power of incompetence. I'll, I'll get to that, I promise. But much like Cinder in Volume 2 acting like a creepy douche to her subordinates, even though they don't give a fuck, Salem somehow takes it entirely too far in the wrong direction by acting different to each of her henchmen in a feeble bid to manipulate them in front of all the other ones. Salem has different approaches when it comes to dealing with different people. Right. That defeats the purpose of manipulating them in the first place. Aloha means hello and goodbye, so aloha. What? They seem to have a slight grasp on how manipulation works when they talk about Raven. The less you know about her, the more intimidating and in control and dangerous and scary she seems. But they completely blow that concept while writing Salem. She's manipulating Cinder by nurturing her strength and power. You will have the power I promised you when the time is right. And Watts by pumping his ego. Well done. Arthur. While strangling Leo in full view of both of them. Wouldn't making them aware that she's willing to treat someone like that make her look weak? Being able to show off just how much of a jerk Watts can be, especially to Lionheart, having him be able to just kind of bully Leo was uh, fun to write. If Watts doing this gets the same effect as Salem doing this... <laughs> Doesn't that make her look comparatively incompetent? Which can boost Watts' ego, as Salem wants to do. But by shifting the hierarchy of power like that right in front of Cinder, who not only hates Watts, but also looks to Salem as someone who can help her become more powerful, she's losing all of her clout. Tyrion watched Cinder come back in failure and be praised for it. To what failures are you referring? Cinder watched Tyrion come back in failure and be dismissed for it. You disappoint me. None of what they're trying to say about these characters is implied at all by the script. Like trying to get across that Corsic and Fennec are schemers and manipulators who wouldn't be on the front lines leading an assault on, you know, like the house of a chieftain or something. Something about them that we really wanted to hone in on was the fact that they are schemers. That's just not in their their character, guys. What you're seeing is not what's happening. But it's totally in their character to listen to Adam's message before the scene starts, discuss it between themselves, pass that information on to Ilya on camera, and then listen to the fucking message again to what? 
Make sure? They won't catch mistakes like this, because I'm not sure they realized why this is a mistake. They've had the idea for Corsican Fennec since Volume 1. They're originally in Volume yeah, 1, sure they were they working with Roman torture. And as such, they've been thinking about them for longer than the audience has seen them. They bought into their own hype. They're so sure that Corsican Fennec are sneaky schemers that it would be totally unexpected and it would raise the stakes if they actually showed up the night of the big political assassination. They're the ones that are convincing that guy in the front line right. that what that person is doing is totally the right idea. But to the audience, it's like, oh, they're there to kill the president of furries. I believe it's time our dear chieftain stepped down, brother. Because the only other time we saw them involved in a killing was when they sent Yuma after the messenger. He rests beneath the waves. But that's not an adequate depiction of their nature, because it's reasonable that they sent a guy who can fly after them. My swiftest messenger. They were introduced as representatives of the White Fang. They represent the White Fang here in Menagerie now. So when we see them giving orders to White Fang members, it's not a demonstration that they're master manipulators. They're just in a middle management position, literally repeating information Adam feeds them whether they believe in it or not. He seems unwell. And a jump cut. The hand on shoulder was something that, like, ooged everybody out. Do they not, like, pass on reference frames to the people working on the next cut? What happened here? Hey, I just animated this close-up of Corsic putting his hand on Ilya's shoulder. Did you want to take a look? Got it. Do you want to take a look before you start animating? No, I said I got it. Maybe just- It's a shoulder! How many possible ways are there for someone to put a hand on it? Two? Well, I still don't want to look. Was their attempt to scheme having them lie in this scene? Because they tell Ilya the exact opposite of what we just watched happen earlier in this episode. The citizens of Kuo Kowana will undoubtedly react poorly now that the chieftain has spoken out against us. It stands out the same as any other blatant contradiction. Fennec can't expect Ilya to buy into that, because she was literally there when the whole crowd didn't give a crap about Gira's ideas. If Lionheart's Mistral has been in chaos was supposed to be a lie, why would he have expected it to work if he knew Crow walked from wherever the fuck he was before and would have seen the people in Mistral. If Raven's I want my brother dead was supposed to be a lie, why did she fight with him once the final battle started? And how about the good guy's declaration of oh, only one of us almost died? If Miles and Carrie were trying to depict these as lies, why in the shiny fuck did Crow and Ozpin react to one of the most believable statements in the entire show as if it was the most transparent lie ever? Thinks he might be able to get together a small raiding party for the bandits. Everything about Oscar is as poorly done as it possibly could have been. I know I left him out of the Volume 4 review entirely, but that's because I actually like you guys. But he went from... Get out of my head! To... All right, it's cool. Sounds good. But it doesn't feel crazy anymore. With absolutely no provocation. And little did I know he'd infect the entirety of Volume 5 with that type of writing. So after Episode 1 ended in, I don't know, maybe we just sit here and do nothing for a while. And Episode 2 ended with, I don't know, maybe I just sit in this cage and do nothing for a while. Episode 3 rolls around and reveals that Crow's gonna go look for Huntsman. You can trust him to put up a good fight. While Ozpin trains these idiots. I believe I was the headmaster of Beacon Academy. Jean has to unlock his semblance. Ren and Nora have to keep their mouths shut because they are absolutely atrocious this volume. And Ruby has to learn hand-to-hand -hand combat. And only one of those things happens under Ozpin's watch, and it's the retarded one. In the last episode, they intentionally show Salem going, If Ruby Rose has learned to harness her gift, then you must take care to protect yours. As though the Silver Eyes is like a cool, powerful thing that Ruby could use against the bad guys. And it sure would throw a wrench in Salem's evil plot if Ruby had a teacher who was able to give her the tutelage she needs to manifest the deus ex power through force of will and conscious, pre-established thought, making it not a deus ex machina anymore. But since that would be good writing, we cut back to Ruby and Ozpin and he's teaching her how to punch. Like in the millennia he's been on Remnant, no one ever told him what min-maxing was. Ruby is being trained by a magical wizard and doesn't even think to bring up her silver eye powers after being explicitly asked if she was wondering about anything. Now, is there anything else we can help you with? Salem severely overestimates the threat Ozpin poses because he's not interested in teaching Ruby about the thing that was the reason he led her into the school. You have silver eyes. It's even the first thing he says to her this volume. You 
have silver eyes. As if it's a unique observation. Man, I love the two guys to the left of course the confetti there. Boy, let me tell you, it's really important that your monitor's color balanced because light blue eyes sometimes look silver and make people lose their minds. You know, maybe it was Oscar remarking on them and Ozpin completely forgot about her silver eyes and he's just like, dude, keep it in your pants. We can't hook up with her. You're like legally a thousand now. He's far more interested in teaching her how to headbutt somebody who's going to throw a single haymaker and then be so flabbergasted that it didn't connect that they stand there for assumedly the rest of time or until acted on by an outside force. On top of that, we're left with some painful exposition. This is getting so much more uh, clear clarification on how like aura and semblance and all that stuff works. Yeah, clarification. You forgot to engage your aura again. That's one way to say retcon. You know, we had done several incarnations of explaining aura, but it had been a while and we wanted to try and clarify some different aspects of it. Yeah, when we first started writing the show, we weren't always great at establishing rules and stuff. And we're like, oh, well, we can say it at a convention. It's like, well, that's not great storytelling past us. Yeah. <laughs> aura is no longer passive. Aura is primarily used as a defensive mechanism, passively coating the wielder in a protective force field. And wait, I mean, didn't you call for physical violence against the people who don't watch these things? If you know somebody who doesn't watch the supplemental content, hit them. <laughs> hit them with your words. Or a stick. <laughs> sort of hypocritical if you're just going to invalidate them every volume or, or episode or scene. About a week before Volume 5 premiered, they said in a Q&A that if you have no aura, you can't use your semblance. But then the Yang short happened. But then lots of arguments sprang up to the effect of, no, no, if you see it, that just means it's low. There's a sound effect when it breaks. No, not that sound effect. That's a completely different sound effect. It's more like this sound effect. But guys, if Crow's aura was completely out in volume four, why did Ruby still get the bad luck? I guess you could call me a bad luck charm. Oh, right, because back in volume four, they were still using the rules about aura that they established in volume three. Except that it didn't. Oh well, fuck giving a shit. And the whole thing goes against World of Remnant, which cited having no aura reserve left as one of the use cases for activating your semblance. As they receive more and more damage, their aura reserve will deplete. Fortunately, when a fight turns gruesome, a warrior can also rely on their aura in a different manner. Semblance. And that's only so important that ignoring it incurs physical pain. Hit them. No, I I'm not letting that go. In volume one, aura being visible at all was an indication that you have quote unquote a lot of it. In volume two, we see aura completely deplete with no sound or visible effect to accompany it. And that fight was made by Monty himself, the one guy who you think would be on top of the mechanics of the universe he invented. Low aura, no flash. 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 Broken aura, no flash. Broken aura, no flash. No aura, semblance activation. So yeah, this clarification of aura they gave probably only applies to this volume because they realized having a passive shield constantly protecting you would make it slightly harder to do shitty writing tropes. No amount of stuff they wrote will stand in the way of letting them write the rest so badly that it actually comes off as offensive. And speaking of offensive, this music is from a goddamn after school special. I can't do it. John's like you! I mean, the soundtracks have been going downhill since volume one, but this... And you will too. Why? <laughs> cool. Listen to how it's almost indistinguishable from the first Google result for easy listening Muzak. Just amazing. As per uh, usual. Him and Alex and Casey really stepped it up. I may not be the most equipped to explain why this sounds so bad, but isn't this track just begging for Chuck Mangione to come in and save us from this abysmal dialogue? The same might be said for all of you. Unlocking your semblance isn't the end. You can still grow and evolve. Providing you're willing to put in the work. Listen to Ren. Some say your personality and character can define your semblance, while some claim that it's the other way around. Unless you value your sanity. Of course, there are still many who don't see a connection at all. Why does that exist? How can a statement be that devoid of meaning? It's something, the opposite, or completely unrelated. It starts off like a philosophical quandary about destiny and predetermination. Is Yang so abrasive because she needs to take abuse to get powered up? 
or does damage help her because she's so brash? There's a little something there to pique your interest. But then they just throw out the, or oh, shit, may maybe Monty just thought it was cool and we're all dumb for thinking about it. And not to mention the people who go their whole lives without a semblance. What does that say about their personalities? Torchwick had one of the coolest personalities in the cast. What relationship did that have to no semblance? This reminds me of when a celebrity gets a DUI or something like that. It's hard to know when you know sometimes. Rin semblance was unlocked from intense stress. And they have to do community service instead of picking up trash along the highway and they decide to do some like daytime TV PSA about drug awareness. Stop it. Get some help. This scene has the most embarrassingly bad voice acting in the volume. And that's saying something. Because Raven makes an appearance in this episode. My kids are put off watching the last volume. Really? Yeah, they're they're disturbed when they hear my voice. I'll even have the cooks whip up something for you. And the direction is absolutely abysmal. There are four instances where a character walks into frame, hits their mark, stops, the camera recenters on them, and then they deliver a line. This is worse than how they directed soap operas in the 60s. Walk here, stop, say your line. Cut to camera two, hit your mark. I said your mark, Never mind. we'll just adjust the shot. Okay, cut to camera three. Why is camera three there? Th this shot is so ugly. Sorry boss, the actual camera guy was sick today. I'm the script supervisor, they asked me to fill in. So who's supervising the script? Oh fuck it, who cares? Okay, cut back to camera two. Get her in frame, goddammit. Okay, back to one. Don't walk in front of the camera. Tighten up, you cluds. N never mind. just pan out, pan out. Oh, I don't get paid enough to deal with this shit. This scene should not exist. The cutting room floor is too good for this mess. The series would only be better for its exclusion. The idea that Ruby needs to know headbutts and fisticuffs instead of silver eyes is the type of idea that should have ended in seppuku, not on top of some animator's to-do list. Oh, what's next? How do you follow that? Just cut to something random. Your mom kidnapped me? You kidnapped her? No, Yang, she was in that cage for fun. What did you think was going on? Raven is really bad, generally unlikable. You know, it's it's funny, I didn't really care for Raven's character for a lot of this, well, ever, actually. <laughs> I was about to say. But that's to be expected from a character in Ruby. I mean, a bandit leader, sorry. But look at this huge treasure chest, and all these gaudy rugs. And all these things she stole. There was a lot of care put into Raven's tent. We mm -hmm. called out specifically in the script that a lot of her belongings should look like knickknacks from different places. So if they come across a house with a nice tea set, oh, cool. Mm, this is mine now. Yeah. Aren't bandits jerks? Bunch of jerks. You know, don't they attract grim? With attitudes like the ones they have. Grim tend to be pretty interested in them as well. Isn't Crow the one who said bandits move around all the time? As long as they keep moving, they've got a better chance of survival. But also the one who told Yang that her mom had set up camp and stayed there for over a year? I know that Crow told you where your mother's been at these days. Is this canon confirmation that the presence of maiden power is enough to defend against the amount of Grim a bandit tribe's level of negativity would attract? Or that it's calming enough to make mean bastards calm the fuck down and not attract so many Grimm in the first place? How ruffled would your feathers be if you had to escort the girl that just bruised your face horrendously? Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't the existence of this permanent bandit encampment defended by a maiden undermine everything Ozpin ever stood for in a way that the writers themselves don't even realize happened? If you people don't keep it together, this place will be crawling with Grimm. They're unintentionally flooding scenes with subtext just to contradict. Predicted. You don't want to get mixed up in all of that, Yang. Ozpin is not the man you think he is. Raven is trying to turn Yang and Weiss against him by making inaccurate assumptions about Yang and her friends. You and your teammates might as well be the poster children for the Huntsman Academies. Which Yang doesn't address. She's just like, It's what Huntsmen and Huntresses do. Instead of going, Nuh uh, I joined for fun. I want to be a Huntress, not really because I want to be a hero, but because I want the adventure. Suck on that. Some people are just in it for the money. Yeah, like Weiss! Hey, speak up! We're not gonna give her the satisfaction of thinking she's right, are we? I know I've railed against the concept of people signing up for a job that will end in their gruesome death just for profit, but, um, hey, you know, a contradiction's still a contradiction. Or what, by saying bad things about herself? Your Uncle Crow and I didn't attend Beacon to become Huntsman. 
We did it to learn how to kill Huntsman. The oh-so-shocking reveal that the person who grew up a bandit and returned to bandit life immediately after going to combat school was in fact going there to learn how to be a better bandit? Now gasp. Okay, now look at each other. What? You thought she went to combat school and then decided immediately to go back to banditing for what? Completely unrelated reasons? Yang, please. Constant attention, extra training missions, turning a blind eye whenever we happen to break the rules. Sound familiar? And what's with this look? The closest thing that I can think of is when Blake got the third degree for breaking up a white fang heist, which no other huntsman even bothered to show up to. Ugh. World building, huh? The person who truly got a blind eye turned to their wrongdoing was Carden. <laughs> Extra training missions? <laughs> what? How about... Uh, less than everyone else because Pura and Mercury took over one meant for Blake. Miss Belladonna? So was this meaningful look like, what the fuck is she talking about? We never got any of that stuff. How much do you know about Professor Ozpin? If she really wanted to turn Yang against Ozpin, just tell her that if it were up to him, no one would be able to use the maiden power that kept their wooden shack full of bandits safe from the Grim in one place for near on a whole year now. These groups travel the lands, never settling in one place. But for that to be the case, Miles and Carrie would have to realize that's what they wrote. Do you think those torches are the kind that have like a little bit of anti-bug yeah, stuff in it? It's actually, it's anti-Grim. Anti-Grim torches? Yeah. yeah. That's that's not canon, don't put it in the wiki. Now go ahead. Instead, logic is stepped over entirely just for the sake of lack of clarity? The man you know as Ozpin designed those schools. Wait, first of all, the man you know as Ozpin is wrong. The man known as Ozpin was an innocent kid, just like Oscar, who got taken over by the entity when the last host body who wasn't called Ozpin died. And I don't know why they're beating around the bush and not just calling him the King of Vale. The warrior king, the last king Vale would ever have, founded the Huntsman Academies. Unless that's getting retconned too. Ozpin's predecessor founded the schools. And has followers inside every academy on Remnant that are loyal to him? That doesn't make any sense. How could he have... No. Why would someone even do that? Yang, no. Yang, no. Oh. Why would someone want loyal followers in positions of power? That's your question. The stated goal of this volume was to make the whole situation seem far-fetched and outlandish and magical and preposterous and thesaurus.com refused to connect, try checking proxy and firewall, and staggering. In this world, there are a lot of things that to us are super magical, like dust and glyphs and petal bursts and all that stuff. That is not magic in the world of Remnant. I remember Monty always making a really big deal about that. And the way to convey that is not by having Yang decide she doesn't want to ask how this was possible. In a world of things that are impossible to us, this thing is impossible to all of them, which makes it so weird. Instead, she asks a question so basic that it puts Yang right on the bottom of the uncanny valley for not finding the position enviable. And of course it comes off as unnatural because neither the writers nor the other characters can relate to this feeling. But in the long run, Crow's like, hey, it's pretty rad if I'm being completely honest. Yang. That's enough. I, I think I would say yes to that power. Now, talking about how bad each line is isn't really easy when they're all so bad on so many levels. The creatures of Grimm have a master named Salem. Why should we believe any of this? Like, this line in itself is too long and redundant. Weiss's What? Already implies that Raven's yarn doesn't sit with them. So Yang could have just said, prove it. Or, I don't believe you. But it had to be a question, so Raven could praise her for finally asking a question. Now you're catching on. So far you've done nothing but accept what others tell you. But you need to question everything. Even though her first line in this scene was a question. So, what's the truth? Yang's problem wasn't that she didn't question enough. She'd been questioning why her mommy left her her whole life. That question, why? I didn't know the answer, but I was determined to find out. Raven is not listening to what Yang is saying loud and clear. Take a moment to wonder if you're already where you belong. Save your breath. You could spout off whatever you want, but nothing is going to keep me from my sister. She was never trying to take Ozpin's side. She was trying to protect her sister. She has no frame of reference for the Salem versus Ozpin narrative you're spinning. He told us some things that you're gonna wanna hear. Things I can't trust will make it to you in this letter. And Raven never makes a case for why Ozpin is wrong. The way in which Raven introduces this concept to Yang makes it seem that Oz was doing something a little more shady than maybe he actually was. Despite having one in her big dumb glowing eyes. She literally uses ad hominem against Crow as her opening argument. If she's with Crow, 
then she's already a lost cause. This girl's a lost cause. What does that mean? Twice! By now, your uncle has surely told Ruby and her friends plenty of stories. You're three times a lady. Daddy and uncle left that part out, hmm? Why would you side with a guy who's willing to work with someone who wanted to murder people 18 years ago? You should side with me! Take a moment to wonder if you're already where you belong. Someone who's murdered people consistently for the past 18 years for no discernible reason instead of being there for you as a mother and who wants to continue murdering people, including the guy I'm trying to make sound bad to you. I want my brother dead. She says Oz has a secret. The old man Oz has a great and terrible secret. And that it could spread fear. One that could spread fear across the world. But if that's how she's spinning it, isn't she painting Ozpin as being in the right? You know, he can't just go around spouting off stuff about maidens and magic and whatnot, otherwise that could cause some problems in the world. I know I've railed against the concept of Ozpin keeping this information a secret, but, um, hey, you know, a contradiction's still a contradiction. Oh, it's so great! We can do anything now that scientists have invented magic! She says Salem will kill every she will not rest until humanity crumbles at her feet. But doesn't say what she's doing to prevent it. Uh, I don't know. The one word that defines Raven is that word that Bernie wanted to exist. We need a word for the feeling that somebody smarter than me is working on this, and this is okay. Carrie does acknowledge that Raven's a hypocrite. Raven's um, a little bit of a hypocrite. Which would be an explanation for her hypocrisy. But Miles can't leave well enough alone. She's trying not to let herself fly off the handle anymore. No, no, I'm not saying that the rest of the commentary is full of outright contradictions of what's happening in the show. We already get that. No, this. Raven is a very interesting character to me because she had the same effect on the audience that she's intended to have on people around her, which is the less you know about her, the more intimidating and in control and, and dangerous and scary she seems, which is why she's very standoffish and gives very vague answers and acts very aloof. That's not what she's doing. But the more you start to learn about her, the more you realize she's faking it a lot. She puts up a lot more confidence and swagger than she actually has. In front of her bandits, she openly admits that Salem is too much for her to handle. Instead of getting wrapped up in something too big for you, for any of us. She tells Yang she's outright terrified in private. But with every new discovery I made, the more horrifying the world became. When Cinder shows up, she straight up announces her intent to tuck tail and leave. Pack your things, then break down camp. We're moving. And then just capitulates. She works out a plan to cut and run with her right hand. We'll grab the relic and make our escape. And the only person she even attempts to manipulate is Leo, the coward. We have two cowardly characters having a conversation. One's aware of it, the other one's not. <laughs> Who doesn't buy it for a second? Who are you trying to convince? Those are all of her scenes where she has any significant dialogue. She never makes a case, even a dishonest or manipulative one, for why Ozpin should be impeded. And the people that can get in and learn more about her, it's like, girl, you scared. She never lies to Yang, except for saying Crow is blind, which is stupid. You'll end up just as blind as Crow. Because she's about to send Yang straight to him as a reliable source to back up her story. Or you could ask your uncle. You know. The guy who's blind. Don't you dare talk about my family like that. Yang sure changed her tune quick and then changes it back the next time it comes up. Mom? Shouldn't she say our family? Why separate mommy dearest from the family for this one line? Yang's arm thing is strong enough to atomize this table, but not to break this teacup. I would just like to call out the attention to details. Okay. Listen to your friend, Yang. Your teammates never let you down before. Uh, so... We know the end credit scene where Yang and Raven talked got retconned, but like... How about the other scene in Volume 2 that Raven was in? And the conversation in Volume 3 that referenced it? I, I was in a lot of trouble, but when I came to, the person attacking me was gone. And I thought I saw... Her sword. I mean, she was there to witness the full extent of Yang being let down by her teammates. You mean you talked to her? That was real? <laughs> I know more than you realize. Not just about you, and not just what I've been told. So far, you've done nothing but accept what others tell you. A little bit of a hypocrite. I mean, yeah. just a tiny just bit. Like the just like the tiniest bit of a hypocrite. And in case you thought being the worst written character in history is the only reason to hate Raven, she never tries to rationalize any of these possibilities. You didn't believe what she said, right? Of course not. Well, not all of it. 
it was crazy. Okay, so the Yang's a fucking moron, but Weiss has prided herself on her intelligence in the past. The smartest girl in class. Even though she's also a fucking moron. We have dust, semblances, but I mean, there's no such thing as magic. Semblances exist. They defy explanation, and they are supposedly unique. Everybody has a unique semblance. Yes. And uh, you will learn unique more about that. Unique being the keyword there. Unique yeah, being the yeah. keyword, yes. Um, and now we reveal that turning into a bird isn't the Bronwyn semblance. Dun, dun, dun. Which is a pretty big deal in the world of Remnant. I think the one thing that was probably the hardest to get across, which we probably could have done a better job of, is like, yeah. why turning into a bird is such like a weird big deal. People don't have like two super different semblances. That's just not a thing. But I know she fought with glass. I don't think that was her semblance, though. Oh, I'm sorry, Volume 2. You reached for the stars, but you're not canon, and you never will be. I remember <laughs> I saw some people that were like, guys, 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 that bandit's got this crazy semblance. And we're like, nah, we just kind of like the goofiness of it. Volume 5, what the fuck? I Get out of here. You're not canon either. That was like five episodes ago. Shut the fuck up. But it's not rocket science to say, okay, well, maybe Ozpin's semblance turns people into birds. Maybe Salem's semblance is to control Grimm or whatever. Or maybe the Maidens, who uh, Raven didn't mention on screen, so I wonder why I am right now, had a genetic semblance like the Schneez. Unique. Which would explain why there are four of them. The four sisters. And that one of the traits of this ability is to transfer the great power from host to host. So the fact that one of the only people Ozpin ever told who dared to defy him isn't coming from the angle that there's a totally rational explanation for everything and Oz is just an old man peddling bullshit to stay in power, now here, go listen to Crow and hear how crazy he is, is fucking nuts! Instead, Raven's position seems to be, I know he's right, I'm scared, and no one should do anything about it because we told Bernie we had 10 seasons and now we have to stretch this paper-thin nonsense to its breaking point or else he'll break our thumbs for canceling his cash cow. Who's Bernie? I mean, join Ozpin's impossible war and die doesn't sound so bad when the alternative I'm offering is to not join the war and die anyway because Salem won't stop until we're all dead. There is no beating Salem. Oh, that scene didn't end up being any better. Uh, let's pick another one at random. No whammy, no whammy, no whammy. Stop! Stop it, oh! Alright, this scene didn't leave much of an impression on me at all. So this is like, for super heavy emotional scene between Oscar and Ruby. It's the one where she insists she's actually friends with Pura. When Beacon fell, I lost two of my friends. Penny Polandina and Pira Nikos. Even though they had like, one and a half scenes together? I'll be sure to watch tonight in case you're picked! Just like Weiss and Yang. So do you think it's wise to spend one of the few scenes you get with Oscar doing this? I didn't know them for very long, but that doesn't change the fact that they were two of the most kind-hearted people I'd ever met. Reminiscing about a girl who your most meaningful interaction with was... Uh... What? Do you think when Oscar finally kicks the bucket, you'll get a scene with the next party member saying what a great friend he used to be? But anyway, while she's spilling her guts about Pura, Oscar puts his backpack on and- Everyone loses their minds! This is something Carrie actually fought for! We have a shot where he has to actually put the backpack on, yeah. and we did have to show that, so <laughs> there's trade-offs. That backpack, though. Mm -hmm. Everyone in the animation team loves that backpack. Oh, yeah? And everything about it, and how it was great that we put it on on screen. Despite it being completely unnecessary, one of the animators bragged about handpicking a cut from this scene to animate himself. I don't actually get to animate that much, so I took one shot just like in the middle of this. I took the shot where she says to keep moving forward or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm gonna animate that one. To keep moving forward. Oh, there it is. This scene is where we get to see Oscar have conflicted feelings about taking part in saving the world. How do you handle all of this? Almost like it's something that shouldn't have been left to people who are too young to remember being charged extra for not rewinding the VHS tapes they rented from Blockbuster. We'd have another great war on our hands, and this time, you'd have to fight would ask for this. But those feelings just stop existing by the end of this scene because, I don't know, Ruby knows exactly what to say. I love Ruby's ability to kind of see when stuff's eating at somebody. You're right. None of us asked for this either. Yeah, I think, I think it's what makes her a good leader. She just kind of always knows like the right thing to say. And it's certainly not because they're the ones making her say it. They sound like a crazy person. I mean, uh, yeah, just a little. And also the ones making the characters forget all about their troubles just because she said the thing. She really is remarkable, isn't she? Yeah. And she doesn't actually address anyone's issues. I'm more scared than I've ever been in my life. Oscar is scared of Salem because he's never fought like this before, and Ruby's response is, No shit I'm scared! The girl who won the Mistral Regional Tournament every year since she was 12 died. What makes you think you stand a chance? She died fighting a battle she knew she couldn't win. Jean is feeling uneasy about not having his semblance unlocked. So what does Ruby say? Mine just started working one day, you loser! 
Fuck you, train more, you dead girlfriend having little bitch. Mine kicked in during training one day. Ruby's an insensitive piece of shit. Yang, I, I'm so sorry. I, At least she led with I'm sorry. I, I should have stayed. I, I should have talked to you more. I, I just, I, I wasn't sure if you wanted me around. It. But really? I wasn't sure if you wanted me around? So... Okay, you hear- Just leave me alone. And you wonder what she possibly could have meant for three months before leaving for another continent altogether? The fact that you're even trying says a lot about you. After you just said he's on the menu, whether or not he stands against Salem. What happened at Beacon shows that Salem doesn't care if you're standing against her or not. She'll kill anybody. I'm, and I'm going to reiterate that he decided to even try because of something we're not privy to. You know, in volume four, Oscar was extraordinarily hesitant to all this. Get out of my head! But the more people his age that he meets, the more inspired he becomes, and the more he starts to feel like maybe this isn't impossible. They cut to really bad scenes like this, seemingly at random, to put time in between scenes, even though science dictates that if your characters aren't doing anything, they shouldn't be eating up the screen time. Let's take this opportunity to actually check in with everyone. No. You do not ever have to check in with someone without a reason. Yang's story was the best part of Volume 4, and you only cut to her in 3, 4, 9, and 11. Every time you cut to Oscar or Raven, it feels like 9-11, and this is a result of their attitude towards criticism. We appreciate the constructive criticism comments. So, they're really bad writers, right? If you've made it this far into the video, that's no shock to you. But that means any real criticism of their work looks bad for them and they don't appreciate it. We don't appreciate the criticism comments that are rude. So what they do is that they pretend that all feedback that's already positive towards the show is constructive criticism. And one of the things they mention is equal screen time for the characters. We tried to take some of the things that we learned from Volume 4, like time that we spend with characters per episode. In Volume 4, no one really had unnecessary scenes. Hey, this episode felt like, you know, you didn't even need that scene and we'd look back at it and go, yeah, we didn't need that scene. Except Oscar and Blake. Blake shouldn't have been in Volume 4 at all. They should have made more room for Callie. And Miles, if you're watching this, that's some constructive criticism you can take to the bank. Screw Volume 6. Throw it out the window. I know it's almost done. We're wrapping up 13 right now. Throw it out. Make a Callie spinoff. Volume 4 had some actual good storytelling in it, and they couldn't capitalize on that because they don't listen to real criticism of their writing. Only the people who whined about having to go a whole two episodes without seeing Callie's worthless daughter. You know, if your favorite character is Blake, right. and you don't get Blake for like two weeks, you go into Blake withdrawals. <laughs> but every cut to Oscar or Raven or Weiss in a cage has no bearing on the plot. And worst of all, it didn't even give us any interesting character interactions. Which is really weird because none of these scenes are set in a diner. How are they so bad? So they totally destroyed the first nine episodes with these worthless scenes while Blake goes around collecting, like, signatures for her school play or something? I don't know, it couldn't have been that important. But here's where we learned Ilya's actual motivation. But I guess back then you were just too busy falling for Adam to notice. She's infatuated with Blake and jealous of Adam. I was always jealous of the way you looked at him. Which doesn't look good for her. See, Blake is between 12 and 17 when she was in her relationship with Adam who was between 18 and 23. But when the attraction comes from the younger member, it's creepy enough when the older one doesn't shut it down, but at least they both have issues in that case. But here, five years ago, we have Ilya looking like the exact same character model from Volume 4. And when the older one is into the younger one and blames all her poor life choices on not having those inappropriate feelings reciprocated, that's... That's some next level deviant shit. I wanted you to look at me that way. Blake should not be making excuses for her. You're a good person, but you're making all the wrong decisions. But moreover, it means that she doesn't actually have a rational motivation. She's not exactly wanting to go down the path that she's on. It just no. seems like the path that's gonna get the best results. There's the humans that still hate the Faunus, and there's the others who stand by and let the hate happen. So when she's presented with a path that she likes the idea of more and she thinks it gets results, like of course she's gonna want to go towards yeah. that direction. By doing nothing and staying silent, we let others speak and act in our place. And if we're not proud of the choices they make, then we have no one to blame but ourselves. Beating the hell out of each other doesn't help is something I genuinely believe. Why do you feel like we have to hurt people to get our way? <laughs> because it works. 
<laughs> Fuck you, Adam Torres. That doesn't make it right. But it's something that we thought was an important topic and wanted to make sure that it got time to get a more important message out there. Yeah. Does that make sense? When Blake asks her why she joined, she says, Same reason as you. But Blake was born into it before they were radicalized. You could almost say I was born into it. Ilya tells her entire life story about specifically not being born into the white fang and joining after realizing the racist prick she's been lying to this whole time didn't actually like her for who she was. And suddenly, all the girls that I'd laughed and played with were scared of me. Who'd have thought? Blake actually emulated Ilya when she went to Beacon. No one could know I was a Faunus. She could have lived a normal life if she wanted, but she didn't. We've I already established that. that no one important is killable, and being tied up doesn't have any effect on Blake's fighting ability. Look at how unsurprised Ilya is to find out that their kidnapping attempt didn't pan out. This was also a problem in RBB 13. Why are none of the characters Miles writes ever surprised that their plans fail? Like, why isn't Ilya like, oh shit, what happened to Spider-Man and Captain Nameless Mook? How could they have been thwarted? No, she's just cool as a cucumber. I told you, I didn't want this. Yeah, you sure did tell her that right before shipping her off to Adam. You're being sent to Mistral. To Adam. Did that ever cross your mind? Now, if you'll remember earlier, I talked about the ways in which this fight were good. And now I'm gonna play a completely unrelated clip from a completely unrelated show. Many faunas are known to have nearly perfect sight in the dark. This is a little disturbing to hear. So the one thing to uh, clarify in the writing part of this, yes, faunas have better night vision than humans. The idea was that Ilya is using the darkness to better use her camouflage. Now, knowledge of writing is sort of niche. The only people who really should know the ins and outs of screenwriting are people who are being paid to produce a show for a major production company, which already puts these two behind the curve. But darkness? How do they not understand what darkness is? Turning off the lights doesn't make the walls darker. I understand. That didn't come across super great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, That was the idea behind it. <laughs> they're still the same color no matter how dark the room is. The reason that we perceive the objects in shadows as being darker is that less light is being reflected off of them. Night vision works because certain animal eyes are designed to capture more light. Cat night vision specifically works because the inside of their eye has a reflective layer so that the light bounces around over a longer period of time before the information gets transferred to the brain. Cats can see using only one-sixth the amount of light that people need. Meaning that Ilya, being black, would stand out against the comparatively brighter colored walls, camouflaging herself to a more accurate version of the background colors would be a much safer bet. Also cover up these fucking buckles. Carrie seems to be aware of this error because he tries to make a point about contrast. It's still, <laughs> it's still a contrast. But then trails off, which is almost besides the point because Blake decides she has to burn her whole goddamn house down instead of walking over to the light switch and turning the lights back on. Now as Blake tries to convince Ilya to change her wicked ways by saying the exact same shit she's been saying all volume, except this time with their crotches closer together, we're reminded that there's another fight going on. Let's look at some of the magnificent work the F team pulled off while the A team was working on the Ilya and Blake fight. All right, wait for your Q. Charge forward, get grabbed. Yeah, yeah, keep holding on to the thing that's being thrown. How long have you two been standing there? Okay, clearly so long that your muscles have atrophied and your reflexes have dulled. Wait, you've just been standing there like lemons when you're holding ranged weapons. And stand there legendarily flat-footed and both managed to get hit. Where did the girl who hit Fennec go? Where the fuck is she? Okay, here's a different guy. Still, where'd he come from? How long has he been there with a fucking gun? Uh, he was looking in the direction of this window, so how did he not see sun running up on him? There's uh, nothing connecting the underside of this shawl's sleeves? He could have just ducked his head a little instead of jamming his neck into this gold chain to break it. In fact, he could have just taken his free hand and undone the clip. So after Fennec stops blowing Gira, there's like five whole seconds of downtime in which Sun doesn't move. 
Actually, it's more like eight and a half seconds because nothing was stopping him from attacking Fennec while he was preoccupied with Gira. And they just had to go undermine his great character development from the previous episode. Hurry! Because he learned that when you shout to announce your presence, shut up! Your targets will be made aware and flee. So he doesn't do that in episode eight. No! But Blake does. <laughs> What? I didn't announce myself this time, it worked. <laughs> and I feel like he wants to get revenge for that. Hurry! Because he just throws her under the bus in this episode. Why wasn't her gun already loaded? What's wrong with you, Blake? Your parents' lives were at stake. You heard, Ilya, my family's in danger. Then Blake does this ice sculpture thing, and then they stand there like three idiots retarding at each other for 40 moronic seconds while Corsic and Fennec are unable to defend themselves. Which raises the question of why she was loading ice dust into her gun at all if no one intended to attack an immobilized opponent. Keep absolutely still. Suspicion's based on movement. But when this fight comes back into focus later, further questions arise. Because Fennec stabs Gira with what? His extra sword? Yeah. They're not always the ones to be on the front lines with the biggest sword. Hey man, size doesn't matter. It's really the fact that he brought an extra one. An extra sword he could have pulled out and used while unfreezing his hand? One thing that... I need to get better at is um, a lot of times I'm okay with like off screen aura breaks. For example, is like in the nine and 10 fight with mm. Gira, the fact that he got stabbed in 10 right. to me was because he's been fighting and we just so... didn't happen to see his aura break off screen. I see. Did, did you forget? You did though. I'm not good at a lot of the memory with anything. It's really, really bad. Anyway guys, start counting right now just for fun. Dad! <laughs> That's right. 50 seconds. Gira beats these guys up for 50 seconds, but you can't really appreciate it depending on your general outlook of things because you're either giddy with excitement or terrified at the prospect that Sun is laying in the other room dead. But he fly kicks through the wall after almost a minute. Like, what the fuck was he doing? Putting away his Yu-Gi-Oh cards? So in between this episode's release for first members, who paid for it, and the release on YouTube, they went back and changed this scene of Blake, because I guess they remembered Ruby was supposed to be a comedy. And having Blake just disappear in between cuts is one thing, but actively acknowledging the disappearance by trying to fix it and failing is way funnier. But don't let that stop you from appreciating that the fight gets really good again for 15 seconds. This is a really cool combo. Sun being oblivious to the fact that Ilya is essentially disarmed because her whip was frozen. Her whip which was over there and she went to go get it without crossing into any of these f frames. Oh, camouflage, that makes sense. Anyways, her whip is frozen and Sun, being an idiot, just breaks all the ice off it. And then she tries the exact same shock thing that she did with Blake. <laughs> But it doesn't work for some reason, and she actually looks surprised. Which I really like, because it adds some, like, legitimacy to the cool moments of the fight. See, Yahtzee made a point in his review of Max Payne 3 that things can only be really cool if it has the potential to go horribly wrong. But it's testament to the nicely organic nature of the slow-mo stunts that you can fuck them up royally. And that's a rarer phenomenon than you might think in Ruby in anything other than a meta sense. Colossal failure. Because this load-bearing pillar crumbles like it was just decorative, even though it was on the half of the room that wasn't on fire, and Gera reveals that his semblance is defying the laws of gravity. Not that I doubt he can lift this, but it would tip over because he didn't catch it in the center. And he should just let it tip over because then it would be easier to hold up if he puts one side on the ground. Fennec grabs this weapon that can shoot from range, and then stands up with three. Turns them to fire, and uh, again, instead of shooting from range like a normal person, Especially a normal person who doesn't believe in the mission, according to the people who wrote the fucking show. It's really around this point where they're starting to see some of the cracks forming in Adam. I would say especially um, Fennec. Especially Fennec, yeah. yeah. Runs in to sacrifice himself for the mission that the writers themselves said he doesn't believe in anymore. You just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. And then Callie busts in, having beaten Batman to death with a tea tray that can stop bullets. And don't think the irony is lost on me that they sent Batman to kill the brooding girl's parents. Not that Callie really intended to make it difficult on them. Do you have a better idea? She really should have said, Those pillars are just cosmetic! They have no mass! You shouldn't be trying to use them as cover! Something that happens every single season is that the fans will latch on to a background character and love them to death. And Cute Guard here is yeah. one of those. 
does. Now Callie shoots, aims again, and fires twice in just over one second. And then she gets missed by a little bit, and then she just stands there out in the open for nine seconds with nobody shooting at her. And then the remaining 20 seconds of this scene play out without another shot being fired. How are we supposed to take any of this seriously if the randos don't fire their guns, and the big boss guys get killed by tea trays, or themselves? Why should we care? The fight animation just honestly gets worse from here. It's amazing how much their priorities shift from episode two, where they're like, Final layout, they also went back in and had to do a lot of island continuity, which is everyone's favorite thing. Hmm. Continuity. And in the big four episode finale, they're like, Shooting a little bit more towards the walls so that we wouldn't have to show somebody in the background unless we wanted to. Hmm. You know, obviously continuity's a very important thing. There's sometimes where it bit us in the ass. So they just do whatever the fuck and have characters jump cut around. Even one character jump cuts while being on screen the whole time. Can we talk about this? That's Bam! Okay, Oof, yeah. starters. Claire. Claire Air. That was the first fight thing she's ever done. Yeah, I can fucking tell that that was that animator's first day. It should be their last, too. Uh, looks amazing. Thankfully, I have been rescued by the floof artist who did a masterful breakdown of every animation error in the Battle of Haven, leaving me to focus on all the other things wrong with those last four episodes, like the build-up to them. So who remembers the end of this exposition dump episode? All right, that checks out. Now, who remembers all the way back to episode two? You and your team will meet with Dr. Watts and together convince Raven Bronwyn. Understood. Not you, Arthur. What, is there a different Dr. Watts that I don't know about? Technically, I was also a doctor. Meet up with Dr. Watts. No, Dr. Watts, not you. None of these guards are, are guarding. Like he's looking off to the side and then he snaps his gun towards these intruders. Then he, he lowers it and, and points it back. As if that's gonna be more intimidating than already having the gun pointed at them? Huh. This says a lot about the threat determination in this show. The longer we think about this gun, the less sense it makes. What, what's, what's it gonna do? Nothing. It's this act of pointing it. That's supposed to be where all of the emotion is, not in the actual threat of having a gun pointed at you. That's why they did it twice. He doesn't pull the trigger. He, he doesn't. He just lets Emerald walk up on him. The, there's no fight. So the highlight of the ninth episode of Volume 5 is right at the beginning of the commentary. She actually isn't sharpening her blade, she just enjoys petting it. Because it's, it's disposable and, and replaceable. But then you remember back to episode 2 once again, when something disposable and replaceable and with the ability to teleport decides to exert extra effort to defend itself. Oh, okay, so you can give yourself a self-deprecating chuckle when Raven does something stupid, but when that exact same stupid thinking was used to kill off a character in a serious scene earlier this fall, why is there a pillow there? It wasn't there before, and the one she was sitting on isn't there in the next cut. Right. We planned for this. What? What we're about to see is part of a plan? Leave us. Pack your things. Then break down camp. We're moving. What I really liked about this scene was Raven's frustration with her tribe of bandits, who so far this season keep goofing up. So shouting at your men in the most obviously fake bad acting way imaginable is not in fact a code phrase to set up for an ambush. It was just bad acting. I feel like Anna did such a great job with mm -hmm. the actual lines, like getting them out there. You got the whole message. We're the guys you should be afraid of. I doubt anyone should be afraid of you. A vital festival finalist and a magical maiden. Okay, Raven, whatever you say. That's what I thought. Actually, you know, not whatever you say. Stop saying things, please. How about the Vernal misdirect too? <laughs> Which we'll, okay, we'll be getting to later. We went out of our way to make sure that that got misdirected. Vernal. Basing an entire story thread around subverting some hypothetical expectation that a character's name isn't actually stupid enough to be taking the piss. It's always very hard to try and keep a twist from getting figured out. Might not be the best way to write. Very smart fans. Vernal exists to make us think she's the Spring Maiden because <coughs> we're only Equinox. The idea was definitely like she probably had a, a different name when she joined up with Raven, but then once the two of them kind of came up with this bait and switch sort of idea, she gave herself the nickname Vernal. And we hinted that too with Cinder's last name, Cinderfall. So why is Raven, the person benefiting from this subterfuge, the one to call attention to it in the very moment she needs to keep it the most secret? The Fall Maiden with a surname so appropriate, she probably picked it herself. If you have so little faith in Cinder's intelligence that you're willing to just drop hints about your double cross right to her face. Something tells me you've got more than a slight case of egomania. Why do you feel the need to be sneaky at all? 
Although we must take into consideration that how intentional the sneakiness was is uh, dubious in the first place. Oh. This is another thing that we added a little bit later. It's just how much of a misdirect we wanted to show with Renal. It's mostly for the audience because the first scene in which eyebrows get raised is in episode four when Renal is supposed to have done lightning and Raven says, thank you. Enough! Thank you. But here she is, with no maiden eyes. Clearly a clue left for the observant viewer who prides themselves on analyzing every subtlety of this masterpiece. And not a regular animation error like all the other ones. Vernal tweening back to this T-pose doesn't imply that she thinks this stance will give her a combat advantage. No, it's a subtle hint that she is not a maiden. It seems like they're trying to keep this on a need-to-know basis if she's willing to put up this act for the sake of two people who aren't even out to get her. Like, uh, okay. Raven won't tell you where the spring maiden is, but she'll let you get within ten feet. Your mileage may vary, however, because on the exact line your eyes will follow between Vernal's fakery and Raven's cheeky sneakiness lies a big fuck-off hole in this disastrous red herring. You expect me to believe that after Mr. YouTube tries to demonetize Yang for saying a cuss to their precious tribe leader, no one thought to even give her the side-eye while Gundam Lagan is stomping around? They'd see her entire lack of a covered face doing maiden stuff! Not that fixing that would have made this line work, I mean, look at her first confrontation with another maiden. This is the long lost spring maiden. Prove it. Cinder's even staring at her while she's maidening. It even cuts to a close-up of Cinder oogling her and at no point was like, wait a second, her eyes didn't go Cinder's eyes go in the same scene. At what point does Cinder go, I don't know, maybe I should have seen this coming. So we're just supposed to accept that the bad guy we've spent the most time with is that fucking stupid? And tell Salem she'll get what she wants and more. It's not too far-fetched. Yes, Fernal. I followed them as you asked. Since we're supposed to believe Raven would be stupid enough to send the person we're supposed to believe has a reasonable chance of being the Spring Maiden on a scouting mission instead of literally any of her worthless, expendable dumbasses. Uh, this is another small thing we did with Fernal that is one of those things where if you don't notice it, it's not a big deal. She's also very importantly stealthy. Like, she <laughs> enters several scenes without a huge mm -hmm. commotion, you know? Enough! The writers shouldn't be wasting their time setting up twists because the only expectation we have to be subverted is whether they're stupid enough to mess it up or whether they think we're stupid enough to believe they didn't. This is the plot, by the way. I want my brother dead. Contained within one eight and a half minute exposition dump. Order him to invite Crow right into an ambush. Now this is a proposition I can get behind. All right, ladies, let's pause for a moment. So in exchange for opening the vault, Cinder's gonna kill Crow. Which is a big problem, because the entire point of the first half of this volume was that Raven can make a portal directly to Crow at any point in time, and literally does that in this episode. She could do that right now. I want my brother dead. Swoosh, there he is, shoot him. She could have done that last volume while he was poisoned. She could do that while he's sleeping. Location's not an issue in this situation. And what they lure Crow into is not an ambush. And it must have been so awkward to explain this plan to Cinder and just hope she never realized how stupid it was. All right, here's the plan. I'm gonna make a portal to Crow, taunt him for a little while. And then once he's completely on his guard, I'm gonna make a portal back to the Spring Maiden, who I am leaving with you on the honor system, apparently so that you and your mooks can walk through a narrow choke point into a phalanx of armed huntsmen. Wait, did you say portal? You can just do that? Um... Remember, this is an eventuality that Raven specifically planned for. Watts tries to talk some sense into them and surprise surprise, it doesn't work. Now, I used to think this was because the characters were all really stupid, and they are, but it's a worse kind of stupid. We all thought Jean was the author insert character, but it was Cinder all along. He's speaking very logically. If we leave that school a bloody mess, it will draw the attention of the authorities. Unfortunately, Watts is always a jerk to Cinder. People will make a comment, maybe it's like a criticism or something, and you go, okay, yeah, that's a fair critique but you don't want to listen to them because of the way they said it. Yeah. And therefore, Cinder does not want to listen to Watts. Um, Miles, buddy? Are you feeling okay? Cinder gets murdered because she can't take criticism. Um, 
I mean, I know you said Jean would never jump off a building. I know I'm going through a hard time right now, but I'm not that depressed. Well, like you said, he's not an author insert. If they're willing to backstab others, why wouldn't they backstab themselves? But they're not trying to backstab each other. He's being completely altruistic in this situation despite not liking her very much and Cinder's ignoring him. A doctor. <clears throat> Uh, technically, I was also a doctor. The person with the most brain cells, because he hasn't lost an arm yet. And the one with the clearest understanding of what's going on is offering his help, and you're ignoring that out of spite. And Cinder's doing a very similar thing. And then Raven starts planning the worst double cross ever. When the chaos reaches its peak, we'll grab the relic and make our escape. And flies by Crow so that I can awkwardly transition into talking about him before the big uh, finale battle. Hey, Crow, Oz needs to talk to you. So let me get this straight. Oscar tells Crow that Ozpin has something to say. And as I say that out loud to you, do you see a problem? And I'm gonna blow your mind with this one. We can infer that Ozpin has something to say to Crow if he just says something to Crow. We don't need Oscar to warn us about an upcoming chat. We don't all have serious heart conditions. We can take a little shock like that. But then, yeah, it gets worse. Ozpin doesn't even say anything to Crow after they relocate. So, Oz needs to talk to you. Was a lie. Things aren't looking good, Oz. I think we can both agree that the situation could be much worse. He responds to what Crow said. Yeah, there was a nice little detail in this scene, Oz starting off, still trying to be fairly optimistic. It's optimistic to drag someone into the living room and sit there in silence until he initiates a conversation? Why would he interrupt Crow doing literally nothing in his bedroom closet to tell him that? They've been in this house for a month. They were trapped. There's a curse. Yeah. But the fire has set them free. They Turns out it was haunted. And yeah. now that we've expelled like the evil the spirits, day. they can find be at rest. It doesn't feel lived in at all. Crow's floor isn't strewn about with bottles. It doesn't seem like six rowdy kids have been turning this place upside down with training. There's no spilled syrup anywhere. If we don't hurry, Nora's gonna eat everything. Nora really did eat everything. Ozpin essentially clarifies that the writers totally didn't forget about the beacon relic, they swear. Does that mean Salem has the beacon relic? I was wondering who would be the first to ask. No more lies. No more half-truths. No. There's like a bike lock around it or something. God damn it. Someone get the bolt cutters. Now, is there anything else we can help you with? Obviously, there's so many questions that they have. Yeah, questions he promised to answer tonight. We can't get to every single one immediately. Let's just say I made finding the relic at Beacon a bit more challenging. Why didn't you do whatever that was to all four fucking relics? Without getting into it, obviously there's something a little extra there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, my cane is not a relic. What do you mean, if it was his cane, Cinder would have just picked it up right then and there after she killed the old Ozpin body? If there was something she had to do in Ozpin's office to find the relic, the notion that she was toying with Pura goes right out the window, which means Pura was definitely strong enough to have helped Oz kick her ass back in the basement. And it means Cinder would have been decorating several pikes around Beacon if Jean had actually called Crow and Glinda like he was supposed to. And then, oh my, a phone call. Who was it? It was Leo. This has been two full hours of some of the worst writing of all times, like how Cinder shows up exactly one dinner time after Yang left the bandit camp because if uh, anything interesting happens, the prophecy will be fulfilled and that's bad news for everyone. Ozpin immediately susses out that this is a trap. Now, he did claim to suspect Leo in episode three. He's disobeying specific instructions I had left him. But he got that information from Crow's account of the meeting. Crow told me about your meeting with Leonardo. And he clearly trusted Leo enough to show him the map. And, you know, I'd also like to know how any possible deviation from Ozpin's instructions wouldn't be considered necessary based on Ironwood's behavior. First it was the dust embargo, now it's the closing of borders. Lionheart says he'll try, and a month later, he succeeds. It's a perfectly reasonable time frame. With these coordinates, we can mount a retrieval force and head out in a few weeks. So why does it sound off to anyone? Well, because Leo stepping up and making demands of the council would be character growth. And after reading the script, I believe that's extremely suspicious. Says he had a breakthrough with the council. Thinks he might be able to get together a small raiding party for the bandits. That sounds drastically different from your original conversation, does it not? 
It does. Oh shit, that's literally what he said. Oh man, I was saying the dumbest thing imaginable to take the piss out of the worst hypothetical explanation they can give, but I nailed it. That's not a good sign. As soon as possible does not mean tomorrow. It means as soon as I can convince the rest of the council, I need huntsmen more than they do. Ozpin and Crow in universe don't think character development can happen in Ruby. Despite figuring this out, they don't actually do anything different. They don't tell the students it's a trap. They don't leave Ozpin somewhere safe because they know it's an obvious trap. They just don't. There seems to be more of you than last time. <laughs> hey, you know what they say, the more the merrier. Roll credits. Oh, thank God. I need to thank all my patrons for supporting me and the floof artist for drawing some great art for this review. And of course, CinemaSins for giving me an out before these last four episodes literally killed me. Oscar Pine? Oh no. Oh no, I have to finish this review, don't I? Oh no.